Hello everybody and welcome to this, my first of two videos on the Canon A1. Before we get going, if you learn better by reading, I have a, a printed book that I made that covers everything in this, uh, in, in this video. It's also available in Kindle format, so there are links in the video description to that. I don't have a pre-production copy just yet, but um, you can take the print copy and throw it in your camera bag. You can put the Kindle book on your smartphone or your, your e-reader and then you can take that with you in addition to having this video as a resource. The Canon A1 is a multi-mode 35 millimeter interchangeable lens camera. So let's take apart what that means. 35 millimeter is pretty simple. It can take any 35 millimeter film. Interchangeable lens simply means that you can take the lens off the camera just like that Put a different one on at any time when you're not taking a photo without affecting your images or the film. SLR means it has a single lens. The light travels through the single lens to a mirror that you might have seen when I took the lens off, then through a prism here to your eye when you look through the back of the camera. And that is the single lens reflex housing. And then multi-mode means that this camera can be used in all four different modes that are generally available to photographers. There are different types of scene modes that were developed later on, but the four that are important are program, aperture priority, shutter priority, and full manual. And this was, I believe, the first camera that had all four of those. It uses a center-weighted TTL meter. What that means is that an area that's in the center of the frame, maybe this big, slightly bigger, will provide the majority of the metering information and then the rest of the area around it will provide the minority. I couldn't find the split. Generally speaking, I think it's around 75-25 or 70-30 with Canons. Different makers use different percentage balances. This has shutter speeds of 30 seconds to 1 1,000th of a second and bulb. The viewfinder magnification is 0.83x and has 93.4% frame coverage. So what does that mean? If you look through the viewfinder here, what you will see is 83% of the size of what's going to be on the film. If what you're looking at right now is what would be on the film, then 93.4% vertical means you're going to lose about 6.3% of your framing top and bottom, and 95.3% horizontal, which is what you lose on the sides, means you're going to lose a little bit less than 2.5% on each side. Focusing screen, which is a standard split prism. And back in the day, and I don't know if this is still possible, I'm sure it's not through Canon, but I don't know if it's possible through third-party repair people. But back in the day, you could send your A1 off to Canon and have a grid focusing screen installed, or other focusing screens. But it's not something that can be installed by the user. The flash sync on this camera is 1 60th in X mode, which is a standard sort of flash that looks like this that has a reusable bulb, or 1 30th if you're using a bulb flash, which is one that has FP or M bulbs, and what that means is if you replace the bulb after each use, that's a bulb flash. This was, oh yeah, right here, the first camera that had electronically controlled programmed auto exposure and the first camera model with all four standard metering modes. I should have remembered that better since I just wrote this script a few days ago. Anyway, uh, this was also a historically significant camera in that most if not all program mode capable cameras that followed it used an approach to program mode which is similar to the one pioneered in this camera. Uh, as, as a personal note too, this is also my second favorite Canon camera ever made, my favorite being the F1. I think the A1 is an absolutely exceptional and staggeringly good camera. The target market for the A1 would have been the semi-professional or advanced user. This was a serious camera back in the day, and it was not cheap. It has an exceptional ISO range, which ASA and ISO are the same thing. So the dial, I believe, will say ASA. Yes, it does. and. Uh, 400 ASA is the same as 400 ISO. The ISO range on this is 6 to 12,800. If there were other cameras that came after this that went up to 12,800 until the advent of digital, I'm unaware of them. This included 
a number of new at the time technologies as well, mostly in the way that the circuitry was integrated with the camera's performance. And it also has a more robust internal construction than the balance of the A series, which were consumer grade cameras of various tiers and had less robust, I think that's fair to say, internal construction. It also, the thing that separates it from being a professional tier camera is that it's missing a handful, but only a very small number, of professional grade features. And those include things like mirror lockup, that's the most important one, this camera doesn't have that, and some of the other things that would prevent it from being a true system camera of the time. The prism's not removable, the focusing screens aren't swappable. So um, today, not a huge deal. Back then, a differentiator. On the Canon A1 was done by Canon in Japan from 1978 until 1985. It was preceded by nothing directly as it was a new camera tier for Canon at the time and also included an entirely new function set being the four, four shooting modes for cameras in general. This was followed by the T70 in terms of, of where this camera falls the cameras fell in the lineup of their time, though I kind of think of this camera as being a hair more capable than the 70, even though the T70 has more modes, it has more stuff. Stuff doesn't necessarily mean better. Anyway, I'll get off my high horse now on that. As we do, we're going to go over all of the different things that are on this camera, and we're going to start with the top. Technically on the front, here are the strap lugs. If I had split rings in this camera, which I don't because this camera is in absolutely immaculate condition, it's, I think, it's got, yeah, a little bit of brassing here. It's one of the best condition A1s I've ever seen. It's amazing. Uh, anyway, so I don't want to scratch the finish on it, so there's no split rings. I cut them off the day I got, I got it. But if you had split rings, you just put them right here. Then up here we have a bunch of different stuff on this side. We have the uh, ASA adjustment knob, and all you have to do to adjust the ASA. This is designed to be done one hand, but if I do it one hand, you're not going to see anything that I do. Uh, is you push in the, this little metal clip up here, which is just a couple of stops fat, placed a couple of stops faster than wherever the index is. When you push that in, you can then adjust the index. Now the motion that this is designed for is you put your index finger here, you push it in, and then you can rotate this very easily and that's how this is designed to be adjusted. We also have the film rewind knob and lever right here that we'll use to rewind the film in a bit. This is the film plane index. This is for taking very precise measurements for things like microscopy where you have to calculate enlargement ratios and um, do things like taking light meter reading compensations and um, using the uh, rule of inverse squares to calculate light loss. This button right above it unlocks the exposure compensation dial right here, which will come in important later in the, well, in the second video at the very end. We're gonna talk about it for, for um, double exposures, spoiler right there. But basically what this does is this adjusts the meter reading in the program, aperture priority, and shutter priority modes to give you more or less light. So the one there means one X. One times the amount of exposure you're supposed to have. If the proper exposure is 1 1 25th at f5.6, that will tell you 1 1 25th at f5.6. Minus 1 half is half as much light, which is one stop. 1 quarter means you get 1 quarter as much light, which is two stops from proper. So when you cut the amount of light in half the first time, that's one stop. When you cut it in half again, you get to a quarter stop. Going the other direction, we get to two times the amount of light, double the shutter speed or half the app. I'm sorry, half the shutter, double the shutter speed or half the aperture. Four being two stops is four times as much light. Double the light, double the light again. That's how the exposure compensation dial works. So let's say that you are in program mode. If you adjust the exposure, basically what it's going to do is it's going to pick a different shutter speed and aperture as appropriate for your compensated setting and use that or if you're an aperture priority or shutter priority, then it will take the, fe the, the function you can't control, or that you, yeah, that you can't control, and adjust that. So if you're in shutter priority, and you set it to 1 125th of a second, 
it will adjust the aperture setting to cut the amount of light in half. Whereas if you're an aperture priority and you uh, set it to f5.6, then it will adjust the shutter speed to cut the amount of light in half or double it. So this, then the little white line there is the index to tell you your setting. Com here we have a combo button on top is it the, the battery check button. So when you push the, the, the top of this lever right here down, you'll get your battery check function and we'll see that in the second video. Then we have this white index here and this switch. Basically this turns the viewfinder display on and off. White dot viewfinder display is on. No white dot viewfinder display is off. This means that this allows, now the viewfinder display only tells you what the camera is going to do. It doesn't change anything. Uh, so if you're in aperture priority, shutter priority, or program mode, and you just want to have an undisturbed viewfinder with no distracting information, you can turn this off. If you're in manual mode, it's probably not a good idea to turn it off unless you're trying to see how well you can do it exposure calculation without a light meter. Here we have the flash hot shoe. Over here we have the, the information window. I forget exactly what this is called. I have it written down as shutter speed and aperture window clever name. Okay, so right now what you're looking at are the shutter speeds, and if we switch this switch right here, we're now looking at the aperture speeds. So shutter speed is a black dial, aperture is a gold dial, which we can tell by the different colors that they have assigned to those indicators here. And then this is the switch that allows you to adjust them, just like that. When you are in AV mode like this, you are controlling the aperture, and we'll go over this in the the second video in detail. And when you're in shutter priority mode, you're controlling the shutter, and that is with this wheel on the front, which we'll see in just a second. Okay. This light here is the self timer and battery check light. So let's see. I must not have a battery. Well, we'll see how that works in the second video then. Shutter release button, film advance lever. This is your mode dial right here. A for active, L for locked, meaning you can't take a photo two second timer, 10 second timer. And then here, tucked right behind the film advance lever is your double exposure switch and we'll see how to use that in the second video. On the front of the camera, we have a few different things to see. This, this right here at the top is the, the front command wheel. So this is what we're going to adjust throughout the, cam the videos to change settings. This guard right here that we can flip up this prevents that wheel from being changed. So if we get settings that we like, say program mode, or if we have consistent lighting and we want to set the same settings and not risk them being bumped for like a tabletop studio, then we can flip this guard up and the settings will be protected from being adjusted by accidentally bumping that dial. Here we have the action grip and the action grip comes off. If we unscrew this part of it right here, I'm just going to leave this off for now to reveal the screw and receptacle and this little little peg that the action grip actually clips into. Battery chamber door. This is the lens mounting index that we'll use to line up lenses in the second video. Lens mount right here. This is your flash PC port to connect a flash cable, something that would look rather like this. We'll talk about those in the second video. Then here we have this, the depth of field preview button right here. You push this, this lever in, and that silver spring-loaded spring, spring -loaded bit pops up to keep it open. If you can see that red dot, do not mount a lens. To end depth of field, you just flip that, that part of the lever down, and it turns off. On the side of the lens mount here, we have two buttons, the silver button and the black button. The black button is your exposure preview button. What this does is give you a preview of the exposure settings. If the camera tells you 1 1 25th at f5.6 when you're in program mode because you pushed that black button, that's what you'll get. You can also get that information by half pressing the shutter, but you risk accidentally taking a photo. The silver button is the memory recall button. And basically what happens is when you push that down, whatever settings you have will be held in memory as long as you push that button down. So basically, let's say that you are uh, in a scene where there's some very, very bright light, okay, and you want to take a silhouette photo. And if you just, you have something large in the front, and that's throwing off your center weighted metering. So if you want to catch that thing in front as a silhouette, you pan your camera off to the side to a light source, which gives you a much faster shutter speed. 
hold the memory down while you pan back to your framing and take the photo without releasing this and you'll get the faster shutter speed. We have a few things here to see on the back of the camera. Right up here is the blind, so we'll flip that down. Not sure if you can see that, so let me send some light through the viewfinder. And that blind closes a blind inside the viewfinder so that you can block stray light from coming in the back during things like very long exposures like microscopy or star trails or if you're shooting in a dark room and you want to trigger flash and otherwise pitch blackness this can prevent some of that flash from coming into the through the uh, camera also a good thing to do if you're not using the viewfinder and the uh, sun is behind you for instance so there's a few different uses for that this is the actual viewfinder that you look through to take a photo. On top, on the sides, if you look down from the top, there are some grooves here that you can use to put accessories such as eye cups, magnifiers, things like that, right angle viewers, a bunch of stuff that's specialized and you don't really need it for everyday shooting. Serial number, memo holder, when you get some 35 millimeter film out of the box, you tear the box top off, slide it in here, and then uh, you've got your film reminder of speed, type, and uh, uh, frame count. Canon A1 Japan. On the camera's bottom we have the film advance mechanical coupling here. So if you have a motor drive and there are multiple ones that this one can take, two I think, anyway, uh, you unscrew this and then you can take this motor cap off and, and keep it with the motor drive. There's a little clip for it. And then your motor drive has the mechanical connection through here to the gearing that is used to advance your camera, which you can see right there. If you do not have a motor drive, you want to keep this on your camera or replace it if it's been lost, because having an open motor drive coupling is a very good way for dirt to get into your camera, which can absolutely mess up the mechanics. Film release button right here, tripod socket, and then four electronic contacts that allow your camera to con communicate with the film advance so that the film advance uh, add-on knows when to actually do its job. To get inside the camera we're simply going to lift up on the film re back release rewind knob and the back of the camera will pop open. Here we have the film cassette chamber. This is where we're going to put film in the second video when we see how to use it and load film and all that jazz. Here are film guide rails, these silver guide rails right here, and what the top and bottom ones do are keep the camera from moving up and down, as it, or keep the film rather from moving up and down as it goes through the camera. And then as you can see here with the film in place, you can see those inner guide rails showing through the sprocket holes. When the film back closes, there's a pressure plate we'll see in just a second that helps sandwich this film so it's flat up against those guide rails. In fact, the film back can be taken off of this camera and you can see how the elements of the back of the film in the film back line up with the inside of the camera. So here's the here are the inner guide rails, the shutter housing, the film take up sprocket right here which spins as you advance the film so that the film can be taken up. Uh, and then when you have the film rewind button pressed, which I do right now, it spins freely so the film can be rewind. Film take up spool this is a little roller that rests right up against here and presses the film sprocket holes into the sprocket to help ensure that the film moves through the camera properly. This is a film pressure plate. This is what keeps the film flat where the shutter is. And then this little spring right here keeps the cassette properly aligned so that the film exits it in a smooth and uh, predictable fashion. You can take the back of the camera off with a little pin it's right here and all you have to do to remove the, the back is push that pin downward and then while you're holding it down angle the back out. To put it back in you just do the exact opposite. So I do have some tips for using your Canon A1. The first is that there are some lenses that this camera cannot accept. The Canon A1 can accept all of the FDN lenses which are the ones that look like this that have a black ring and a silver button. And it should, I believe, also accept all of the FD lenses, which have a silver ring here 
and an aperture ring at the back of the lens like this one has. There are some FL mount lenses that it can't accept, and those have a silver ring like this at the back, and then an aperture ring, I believe it's also silver in all of the cases, up at the front of the lens. Those FL lenses that it can't accept are the 19mm 3.5, the 58mm f1.2, and the 38mm f3.8. In addition to those, it also cannot take two of the original Canomatic R-mount lenses. I've never even held one of those cameras or the lenses for it, so I don't know what they look like and can't describe them. But those two R-mount lenses it can't take, and this is not the EOS R-mount. This can take no EOS R-mount lenses. But the Canomatic, uh, can yeah, Canomatic R-mount lenses it can't accept are the 58mm 1.2 and the 100mm f3.8 are some known bugs about the Canon A1. One of them is that some of these will drain batteries, and this is one of them. If they have a bad capacitor or other flaw with the circuitry, I'm not exactly sure what the cause is. Cameras like this specific one here will drain a completely good brand new PX28 battery in a day or overnight. This one will drain one overnight, um, which is kind of frustrating because those batteries aren't cheap. And uh, this battery, this had a battery in it when I started the video, and it was dead because I put it in two days ago. Anyway, uh, one bug that some cameras have that this one does not have, thankfully, is that if you move the aperture away from A and then back to A, that's this aperture ring right here, then it can lock the camera. I've never encountered that on an A1, by the way. I've never seen that happen. Um, this copy doesn't have that bug. Like I said, I've never run into an A1, an A1 that does. But if your A1 has that bug, you can unlock the camera to do that. So let's say that I have, I'm gonna advance the film lever here. Let's say that I have just locked the camera. Okay, I'm gonna move the aperture ring from A back to A. All you have to do to unlock it is move the multiple exposure button right here to the left, advance the film, oops, advance the film lever like that, and your camera should be ready to shoot again. Anyway, there are some things you should not do with your Canon A1. You should not touch the shutter because you can brick your shutter and that's a really good way to ruin a perfectly good camera. Also, don't touch the mirror because your finger oils can cause it to be desilvered, which can tarnish it or desilver it and affect your metering and your viewfinder quality. Don't store your camera in your car because lubricating oils can get very thin if they get hot and get to places they shouldn't be. And then you have a, um, an issue with them having proper, when they get back to having proper viscosity with not working correctly. Uh, also, likewise, in the cold, extreme cold can cause the lubricating oil in the cameras to get very thick and gummy and break down, which can cause the um, uh, lubricate the parts not to move correctly. And that is especially true, by the way, with lenses, but also very true with some of the mechanics in the cameras. Don't store your gear in a plastic bag or box because fungus can grow inside of that plastic environment. Plastic's moisture permeable, and if moisture gets onto your lens elements, you will cert almost certainly get fungus in that condition, and also in your optical system in your viewfinder, and mildew can grow in your, your camera coverings. Don't let your A1 get wet. It's not weather sealed, and if it gets wet, the electronics can short out, and that can ruin a perfectly good camera. And just remember that your Canon A1 is a precision tool that should be handled with care and respect. And as long as you take care of your camera, your camera will take care of you. So that's everything I've got for video one. In video two, we're going to talk about how to use all of the stuff in this that we haven't already gone over. See you there.